Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode number 350, recorded Friday, June 8th, 2018. John Carey Rue, Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the show where we talk to some of the people, uh, some of the most interesting people in tech or the people writing about the most interesting people in tech. And I am very excited about our guest today. In 2003, a young Stanford dropout decided she was going to create an arm patch that had needles in it that would test for various ailments. And for the next de next decade or so, she was definitely someone I would have loved to interview on this show. And I would still love to interview her now, mostly to ask, what were you thinking? Because in 2015, a writer for the Wall Street Journal began to uncover the reality behind the company that she'd started. And the writer, of course, is John Kerry Rue. And he is here to talk today about his book, Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. Thanks so much for joining us, John. Thanks for having me. So I loved reading this book. As I was saying to you before we started, I loved everything about it except for the fact that it's true. Um, I, I wish it were fiction, but it is not. Um, I'm still in a little bit of disbelief that all of this could have happened just so recently. Um, talk a little bit first about who Elizabeth Holmes was and, and why she created Theranos. So she uh, created Theranos in late 2003 after dropping out of Stanford as a 19-year-old sophomore. Um, she really wanted to be an entrepreneur. She, uh, Steve Jobs was her idol. Uh, she loved Apple. Um, and she had a vision for a product uh, that was actually a medical product. Um, it, the, the first um, uh, vision she had was for an, a wristband that uh, would have these micro needles that would draw minute amounts of your blood and uh, diagnose uh, from the blood whatever ailed you and simultaneously uh, inject the appropriate drug. Um, it was more science fiction than, than reality. And, and I think she and, and her co-founder at the time realized that pretty quickly. And uh, after a few months pivoted to something they thought was more feasible, which was uh, a device inspired from the portable glucose monitors that have been around for more than a decade uh, that diabetes patients use to monitor their blood sugar levels. Except uh, Elizabeth wanted a, a portable device that would do uh, way more than just one test. She wanted a device that would do the full range of lab tests just off a, a, a tiny drop of blood pricked from a finger. And that became the uh, vision that Theranos uh, went about pursuing um, and trying to execute over the next decade. Now, if you're watching the video version, you saw first the uh, article by Ken Aletta from The New Yorker and then John's article, which are two of the big, I mean, a big player in this story is the press, specifically the tech press. And John, you're, you're, you're a medical writer. You're, you're not a tech writer, right? Or you weren't a tech writer well, before I, you started writing about this. It, I've done different things in my uh, nearly 20-year career at The Wall Street Journal. I've been a foreign correspondent. I've worked in, in Europe. I've reported on business in Europe. I've reported on Islamic terrorism. Um, in the past 10 years, I've mostly written about medicine, and I'm an investigative reporter, and I, I, and I can um, pretty much choose my topic because I'm an opportunist and I tend to go after tips. But I certainly have done a ton of reporting on medicine and, and the U.S. healthcare system. And, uh, and the way I came on to this story was actually, uh, you know, uh, because of a tip I got uh, from, from someone who had become a source uh, during past reporting on the U.S. healthcare system. So, so that that New Yorker article came shortly before you got the tip, right? I mean, I, I in the book you talk about how you had read that article and sort of it sounded like it wasn't exact. There was something a little off about Ken Aletta, who's also not really a tech writer, but more of a media. Um, it's a little bit of a tech writer, but uh, not a medical so he, writer for sure. Yeah, he's written about. Uh, I think he's written a book on Google. He's written a ton, certainly about the media. Uh, he has definitely not written much, uh, if anything at all, about medicine. And uh, and that was the the pattern among the uh, 
uh, reporters who um, wrote about her and, and put her on the map. Uh, and I must disclose that the, the first publication to, to put her on the map and to give her airtime uh, in September 2013 was my own newspaper, The Wall Street Journal. It was our editorial page that um, did a friendly interview with her, uh, coinciding with when she launched uh, there in those finger stick tests in Walgreens stores. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the first thing that, that gave me you know, a hunch that something was not right at Theranos was the Ken Oletta story in The New Yorker uh, that I read on, on the way back from work one evening um, on the subway. And uh, I guess the, the thing that struck me uh, the most uh, about that story was this notion that a 19-year-old college dropout who'd had, uh, you know, essentially two, two semesters of chemical engineering uh, classes under her belt could just drop out and then go on to pioneer uh, groundbreaking new medical science. Um, uh, I knew that that had happened before with computers and software. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, legend has it, uh, learned to code on his uh, father's computer when he was 10 years old and, and then went on to create Facebook and, and Bill Gates 30 years before him, uh, learned to, you know, pretty much taught himself how to program as well. And of course, built Microsoft. And so these are stories that uh, these are th real stories that had happened before in, in Silicon Valley. But medicine is different. Uh, you know, I knew from all my reporting that you need real training in medicine. You need to have gone to medical school. You often people get PhDs and do postdoctoral studies and, and do years and, and decades of research before they add value. So the thought that she had just dropped out and snapped her finger and invented, you know, groundbreaking new uh blood testing technology struck me as odd. Um, and uh, to be fair, I probably would not have done anything uh, with that hunch if I hadn't then gotten a tip a few weeks later. Uh, the tipster was someone I had uh, encountered in the previous year reporting a story on Medicare fraud and abuse. Uh, he was a practicing uh, clinical pathologist in the Midwest who uh, uh, moonlighted as the writer of this blog. Uh, obscure blog called Pathology Blog, which he spelled B L A W G. Um, I don't think he had very many readers, but he had caught my attention uh, the previous year when I was reporting on Medicare fraud, uh, and I had reached out to him, uh, and he had been kind enough to uh, explain to me the complexities of um, uh, laboratory billing, and um, and that's how we met. And then when he read the the New Yorker story, he had immediate doubts about uh, the claims that Theranos was making in it. And uh, he wrote uh, a skeptical blog item on his blog and was immediately contacted by this little band of Theranos skeptics, one of whom was a, a childhood neighbor of Elizabeth Holmes named Richard Fuse, who had uh, gone on to uh, be involved in patent litigation with Elizabeth Holmes. And, and during that uh, patent litigation had become convinced that Theranos you know, was built on, on a scaffolding of lies. Um, and it also so happened that Richard Fuse had just made contact with a former employee of Theranos who uh, had just left the company and he was the laboratory director. And so when the, the pathology blogger uh, contacted me, uh, it was clear to me that he didn't have firsthand information and that Richard Fuse uh, himself didn't have firsthand information. But uh, the notion that there was someone out there who was a primary source who had just left the company and who did have firsthand information and was alleging uh, wrongdoing, you know, uh, immediately caught my interest. And, and at that point, I knew that uh, I needed to get in touch with this ex laboratory director. And so I, I worked on uh, getting in touch with him. And I did eventually and, and he was terrified. Um, he was being hounded by Theranos lawyers. Um, he would only speak to me on deep background if I granted him confidentiality, which I did. And that, that was the beginning of, of my reporting. So, so you mentioned her obsession, Elizabeth Holmes' obsession with Steve Jobs, um, which was weird <laughs> a little bit. I mean, she wore late. It was a little bit later in, um, you know, in in Theranos's uh, trajectory. She started wearing black turtlenecks like Steve Jobs. She named uh, one of the devices the 4S after the the iPhone, the latest iPhone at that time. Um, and also had like a very deep voice that some people you say in the some people have reported in, in your book you reported said was affected, um, wasn't exactly her real voice. Um, but what what's really struck me as the difference between her and um, 
and people like Mark Zuckerberg, who she actually came up with, um, that was something right. that I needed to be re- reminded of. She wasn't post Mark Zuckerberg. She was at the same time as Mark Zuckerberg. So, but she, she, so much of what, how Theranos was built was her childhood connections. You mentioned her childhood neighbor who was partly her downfall, but then she had another neighbor. She grew up with Tim Draper's daughter, right? Right. Her parents um, and she and her brother had lived in Woodside, California for several years in the late eighties, early nineties. And uh, their neighbors had been the Drapers and Tim Draper was a, of course, uh, uh, coming up as one of the most successful uh, startup startup uh, investors in the Valley. And he has a daughter named Jesse Draper, and Jesse and Elizabeth became good friends. Um, and uh, their friendship endured. Uh, and, and when Elizabeth dropped out of Stanford in 2003, uh, she she knocked on, on Tim Draper's door and, and pitched him, and he cut her her first check for a million dollars. Um, so that, that was uh, an important uh, family connection or childhood connection. Uh, another one was uh, Don Lucas, the the famous venture capitalist uh, who groomed Larry Ellison, helped him take Oracle public in the late 80s. Um, he was introduced to Elizabeth by a friend of her father's. Her father had gone to Wesleyan and had remained good friends with a, a guy who was uh, a high-ranking official at the World Bank. And, uh, and that person um, knew Don Lucas, and so he had made an introduction to Elizabeth and, and Don Lucas was impressed to, to hear that Elizabeth was the descendant of the Fleischmann yeast, uh, dynasty. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the, uh, the very successful company that was founded in the late 1800s by two Hungarian immigrants who'd come to the U S and, uh, and, uh, by the turn of the 20th century, the Fleischmanns and the, the Holmeses became, uh, one of the richest families in America. Uh, later, uh, later generations of the, of the family squandered the fortune. And so Elizabeth grew up with tales of the incredible success of those early generations, but also with tales of the failures of the, of the uh, younger generations, such as uh, her father's grandfather and father, who had both uh, lived uh, uh, sort of decadent lives and squandered away the, the family wealth. Um, and I think that that uh, family context is important uh, when you try to understand the psychology of Elizabeth Holmes. I think she was um, raised to be very aware of this lineage and um, and she wanted to restore, you know, that that family glory and wealth in part. Um, she was also influenced by the fact that her father was a, a civil civ- servant for a public service for most of his career, uh, worked at the State Department at USAID. There were uh, photos of him uh, in war-torn countries providing disaster relief around the house. And he, and he always told her growing up that she needed to live a purposeful life. And so uh, she was ambitious. She wanted to become rich, but she also wanted to do good. And the way to achieve both was biotechnology and, and this, this vision she had for a medical device that would make blood testing better and easier and, and that would uh, eventually you know, help mankind. So by all accounts, she didn't start out uh, trying to um, lie to everyone. She you know, wanted to save the world, as did Mark Zuckerberg and many other people who end up in Silicon Valley. Um, but the difference between them is that you know, this was biomedical technology. This was or just medical technology. It wasn't it, it wasn't. I mean, we could argue that Facebook is has now um is now a dangerous tool that Mark Zuckerberg never imagined that it was as well, but it's not exactly the same thing. Um, so, so, so when, she, why didn't, she, why do you think she didn't um, like try to uh, be like Genentech or some of those other, I mean, you know, the, the Bay area has other, uh, is not all Silicon Valley. It's not tech. There is a lot of biomedical. Why, why did, did she position herself uh, in Silicon Valley amongst these other pure tech companies instead of um, the medical companies that are also out here? Well, she she wanted to be an icon uh, like Steve Jobs had become an icon. Uh, she wanted to become rich and she wanted to become famous and she wanted to become, she wanted to join this pantheon of, of tech legends. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think many people know who the founder of Genentech is Mm -hmm. or who the founders uh, of those other uh, biotech firms and and medical technology firms are, but they certainly know who Steve Jobs is and they know who Bill Gates is. And so uh, she she began to model herself after him uh, in ways that were 
uh, sometimes cartoonish. I mean, she started wearing a black turtleneck in the 2006, 2007 period, uh, because that was the, the job's attire. Um, she, uh, uh, called her early, ver- early iterations of the Theranos device, the iPod of healthcare. Uh, she hired Shai Bay, the, the, um, Los Angeles based, uh, advertising agency because, because, uh, Apple, had used it for some of its iconic campaigns. She even tried to get Lee Clow, who was the creative genius behind uh, several uh, iconic Apple campaigns to come out of retirement. Um, he uh, referred her uh, to the agency. And so she um, she ended up working with a guy named Patrick O'Neill, who was the uh, Lee, Lee Clow's successor. Uh, she uh, uh, scheduled uh, meetings with Shia on Wednesdays because she learned that uh, that's the day that Steve Jobs had had his meetings with Shai Day. And so, you know, the, the obsession with Jobs uh, uh, was really, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was there. And, and uh, I talked to numerous employees who uh, attested to the fact that 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 was like a really a, a guiding obsession for her. And unfortunately, I think that it was a giant mistake on her part because, um, you know, uh, Apple even still to this day, is really a computer company. It's it's computer hardware and it's software. Now the computer is a, is a small phone, but it's still a computer company. Um, and and uh, Theranos's device was a medical device. It wasn't uh, software. It was a blood testing machine that was going to be used by patients and doctors to make crucial health decisions. And so she modeled herself after the wrong industry. Um, and she should have, in fact, uh, looked to uh, South San Francisco and the biotech cluster um, and, and diagnostic companies uh, in the area. But instead, she chose the computer industry. So let's talk a little bit about the, the technology or I mean, the, the device itself. Like, what, what did it look like and how did it evolve over the years? So the first uh, vision was of a, rest, a wristband, as I said, uh, which she called a Therapatch. And I got a hold of an early... Uh, presentation she made to investors. This is back in, in 2005. And there's a diagram of what the Therapatch looks like. Uh, but I don't think that the Therapatch uh, was ever even uh, built as a prototype. Uh, the company quickly pivoted to, um, uh, as I said, a, a device that was inspired by the glucose monitors. And it was basically a, a toaster sized reader and a cartridge. And the cartridge involved microfluidics. Um, and you put the blood in the cartridge and then you, you slotted the cartridge in the toaster side reader and uh, pumps and valves in the reader made the blood flow through the cartridge. Um, and it then came into contact with uh, uh, reagents uh, and antibodies and it produced a chemical reaction that then produced a signal and, and the result would be beamed wires, wirelessly to, to a server uh, and, the, and the result would be analyzed. And, and actually that... Um, a microfluidic system, which uh, was dubbed the Theranos 1.0, they worked on it for several years and they could never get it to work. It was uh, it was totally hit and miss. I mean, it, it was it they they essentially got nowhere with it. And in late 2007, um, you know, she was probably under pressure because of the promises she had made to investors. Uh, so they pivoted away uh, from the microfluidic uh, system, and uh, a Theranos engineer. Um, uh, ordered a glue dispensing uh, robot from a company called Fisnar in New Jersey and used that as the basis for the new uh, Theranos device, uh, the second generation Theranos device, and affixed a pipette uh, at the end of this robotic arm that had three degrees of motion, uh, uh, forward and back, left and right, and up and down, um, and programmed uh, this robotic arm on a gantry to, to mimic the, the steps that a laboratory scientist would do at the bench testing blood. And uh, it was kind of a rudimentary machine. Uh, she had uh, Yves Béal, the, the pretty well-known uh, Swiss industrial designer, uh, design a, a sleek uh, black and white case for it that hid those uh, rudimentary innards. And, and uh, she christened it the Edison after Thomas Edison. And that was that was the second generation of the technology. Uh, it was a machine that could only do one class of blood tests known as immunoassays, which are tests that use antibodies uh, to, to uh, create chemical reactions to, to uh, measure the concentrations of analytes in the blood. Um, 
uh, by 2000, late 2010, uh, Theranos started working on the third and last iteration of the technology uh, because Elizabeth wasn't satisfied with the Edison because it could only do one class of blood test. And she'd already promised uh, not only investors, but two retail partners, Walgreens and uh, Safeway, that she already had a technology that could do all the tests off just a drop of blood. And so uh, at that point, they started in late 2010, started working on what she called the mini lab. And uh, the mini lab was a bigger machine than the Edison because you needed to pack uh, more instruments into it. Um, and by the time three years later, uh, Theranos went live with these finger stick tests in Walgreens stores in Northern California and Arizona. The mini lab was actually still a work in progress. It was just a prototype and it didn't work at all. It was years uh, from being a, a commercially ready device. And so Elizabeth and her boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, who was the number two of the company at that point, decided to go live with the Edison. They dusted off the Edison um, and launched with that for a handful of tests, uh, a handful of immunoassays. And then uh, for the uh, 240 or so other tests on the 250 test menu that they advertised on the Theranos website, they used regular machines made by the likes of Siemens, the, the German conglomerate, uh, machines that any lab could purchase. Um, uh, with one wrinkle, which is that they hacked the one Siemens machine in particular, the Siemens Advia 1800, to try to adapt it to tiny blood samples. And one of the modifications they made is they diluted the blood to create more volume because the Siemens machine uh, was uh, equipped to handle normal size blood draws uh, drawn from the arm. And so uh, they needed to create more volume. And the way they did that was by diluting the blood with a saline solution. And uh, that caused all sorts of problems because the, the Siemens machines already had a dilution step as part of its protocol. And so this was effectively pre-diluting the blood, diluting it twice. And the more you adulterate the blood sample, the more room you create for error. Not to mention the fact that the, this dilution protocol diluted uh, the analytes that the made the concentration of the substances you were trying to measure in the blood so low that it fell beneath the, uh, uh, di the, the analytic measurement range that the FDA had approved for the, for the machine. So it meant using the Siemens machine in a way that uh, both Siemens and its regulator, the FDA, disapproved of. And, and that led to a lot of unreliable test results. It's amazing. I mean, one of the things that you that everyone knows about Steve Jobs is he was such a perfectionist and he wanted things exactly his way and he made demands on people. And, you know, the inside of the computer has to look as good as the outside. And we've heard it all. And maybe the worst thing that's happened as a result of that is people had to work late and didn't see their families. And um, but this was I mean, this was part of what Elizabeth asked. Like she didn't like needles. She didn't she never wanted to draw too much blood. Right. So the samples were so small and needed to be diluted because of her demands. Right. But medical science is hard, and uh, sometimes it doesn't just take a, a bunch of late nights, you know, and and, uh, and a year uh, of late nights to to crack that nut. In fact, to this day, no one has cracked that nut. And by that nut, I mean uh, figuring out how to run many blood tests on a tiny sample of blood pricked from the finger. Um, and and there are different reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that there are about a half dozen. Uh, big classes of blood tests and that each class of blood tests requires completely different methods and techniques and instruments. And so once you've done a couple of immunoassay on your tiny finger stick sample, uh, you don't have any blood left to run the completely different uh, set of techniques that a general chemistry test um, or, or a um, hematology test require. Um, and, and that problem just has not been solved. The, the other problem, uh, is with capillary samples, uh, which means blood uh, that comes from the finger as opposed to a vein in the arm. Um, when, when you milk uh, blood from a finger, uh, often you put stress on the red blood cells and uh, they explode. And when they explode, they release potassium. And as a result, uh, the, the, the concentration of potassium in the blood uh, increases. And this is in fact one of the problems that Theranos ran into and uh, my source, the ex-lab director, uh, told me that they were routinely getting uh, potassium results for patients that were so high that the only way in which they made sense were if the patients were dead. Uh, 
except the patients were alive so that the blood tests were clearly uh, wrong and didn't make any sense. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the, this is, uh, it's hard. Medical science is hard. Um, and, and, uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani and Theranos ran into these obstacles and, and refused to, uh, acknowledge these setbacks and papered over them essentially. So we're talking about like lots of errors and tests. Um, I mean, which can be upsetting to be told that you have cancer when you don't, or to be told that you don't have cancer when you do. I mean, do we think that, I mean, did, is there any proof that anyone died from these errors and these test results? I don't know. Um, I, it's hard to, to prove a, a direct correlation between a health outcome and, and a blood test. Um, I mean, you can have, basically there are two scenarios. Um, one is a misdiagnosis, and in some ways that's the worst because it, uh, if uh, a person has a serious ailment such as cancer and the, and the blood test misses uh, the cancer, then the patient doesn't get treated and, and may eventually die. And then there's uh, the false positive, which is a, a blood test that tells you that you have a condition and you get treated unnecessarily for it, and, and that can lead to all sorts of problems as well. What I did come across in my reporting is more than a dozen examples of patients who had health scares because they got false positives. And uh, in particular, a woman in Arizona uh, who had um, her test done at Theranos and, and six, I think, of her results came back abnormally elevated. And, and she had a, a symptom which was a ringing in her ear. And based on the symptom and then the blood test results, her doctor uh, uh, began to... to uh, fear that she was on the cusp of a stroke and sent her to the m emergency room on the eve of Thanksgiving in 2014. And she spent four hours in the ER at the hospital getting a battery of tests. And um, after a while, they retested her blood, blood again at the hospital and the, those blood tests came back normal. Uh, she then had more MRIs um, the following week to make sure that it really was, uh, uh, that the Theranos results really were false. Um, and by the way, I had a high deductible insurance plan, so ended up uh, spending $3,000 on, on uh, these medical services out of her own pocket. And uh, finally, she and her doctor uh, ascertained, you know, were able to, to conclude that the Theranos blood tests were, were not accurate. So th this is the, the sort of thing that people got put through um, completely unnecessarily. And uh, in terms of, you know, whether, whether people were actually harmed or not, there's a... a patient in Arizona, one of a, a dozen who have sued uh, alleging consumer fraud and medical battery. Uh, he alleges that a Theranos blood test failed to detect his heart disease and that he then had a stroke that could have been prevented. Um, you know, those allegations will have to be proven in court. Um, but uh, what we do know is that Theranos has uh, avoided or corrected nearly a million blood test results in California and Arizona, most of them in Arizona. And um, uh, a source recently told me that uh, the last lab director Theranos had, who recently left the company uh, as part of layoffs, um, was pushing Elizabeth Holmes to void or correct every single blood test uh, the company had ever returned to a patient uh, because he felt the, the quality control had been so abysmal that Theranos couldn't possibly stand by really any of the test results uh, that it had given patients. So now you you'd be talking about almost 8 million blood tests uh, avoided or corrected. Well, we should take a step back and talk a little bit about why, uh, how they got into the hands of patients. So first they, they uh, first Theranos tried to go uh, to partner with pharmaceutical companies, but that didn't really work out. So then they moved to Safeway and Walgreens. And I mean, there was an, so much interesting things going on with these two companies fighting with each other. Talk a little bit about what role those two companies had in, uh, in pushing these devices more quickly than they, they should have been. Right. I'd say Walgreens was a, a key um, uh, a, a key to a lot of this and, and how, um, you know, this this fraud was uh, perpetrated and how it lasted so long. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani approached Walgreens in early 2010 and um, asserted to, to the company that it, they, they had this technology. It could do a bunch of blood tests off just a drop of blood from a finger. And Walgreens hired actually a uh, lab consultant uh, named Kevin Hunter, 
to help it kick the tires and, and uh, verify that uh, Theranos' claims were true. And this guy, Kevin Hunter, traveled with Walgreens executives several times to Palo Alto to meet with Elizabeth and Sonny. Um, and he started asking uh, questions and he wanted to see the lab. He asked for a comparison study. Um, and soon uh, Elizabeth and Sonny were, were displeased with him and, and his nettlesome questions. And they asked Walgreens to no longer include him in in-person meetings between the two companies and in these weekly video conference calls that they had. And uh, they made clear that they would walk away if uh, Walgreens, uh, you know, didn't do what they said. And so amazingly, Walgreens at that point excluded its own lab consultant uh, that it was paying, you know, to protect its own interest from uh, meetings going forward. And, and he was marginalized and, and uh, he, you know, he tried to uh, prevent, he, he tried to argue with his, his superior at Walgreens to, to not... Um, do this but uh walgreens did and and the reason walgreens did walgreens was obsessed uh with its rivalry with cvs its larger rival which is based in rhode island walgreens is, is based in the suburb of chicago and uh executive executives at walgreens uh saw everything through the prism of this rivalry and they were uh, terrified that uh, theranos would walk away and uh turn to cvs and strike a deal with cvs and that then um, you know that partnership would would uh, be a great success, and that Walgreens would would be you know regretting it for the next ten or twenty years. So uh, the fear of missing out, uh, FOMO as it's known, uh, played a big role in in uh, the way Walgreens uh, accepted uh, Theranos' claims at face value. It feels like FOMO was, uh, it feels like Safeway and Walgreens and the tech press and the investors were all experiencing that. Like they didn't want to be the ones that, you know, were writing about Steve Jobs 20 years later. Like they they wanted to be the people discovering them, right? I mean, discovering her. A absolutely. Um, you know, R Roger Parloff, uh, the correspondent at Fortune, wrote uh, the cover story uh, about Elizabeth Holmes in the June 2014 issue. Um, and his attention was initially attracted by something else, by this uh, patent suit between uh, the, the childhood neighbor and Elizabeth Holmes. And, uh, you know, uh, the thing that he found interesting was that uh, David Boyce himself had litigated it on behalf of this company that at that point he'd never heard of. And um, he called up David Boyce's PR handler and and uh, that was initially his angle. Why is David Boys doing this case? And it, there's also, you know, the, the brother of one of the uh, defendants, uh, who's also the son of the other, um, is is uh, saying that he did nothing wrong and that these patent theft allegations are completely true. He's threatening to sue Theranos and Boys, And that's what got him interesting. And the PR handler was successful in uh, reorienting his attention to Elizabeth and her achievement, her supposed achievements. And to Theranos and, and argued to him that, you know, this was uh, this was the equivalent of Google or Apple be before they became uh, icons of Silicon Valley. And, and that um, that his story should focus on that. And, and that's what his story ended up focusing on. He went out and met with Elizabeth and interviewed her um, over seven hours uh, in several increments. Um, and and that cover story in June 2014, she had already been put on the map by my own newspaper, uh, our editorial page, and, and then uh, Wired uh, had written about her as well. But that Fortune magazine story is really what rocketed her to, to fame and, and made her a celebrity. Yeah, I mean, she was one of the most influential people in 2015 from time. Like, she hung out with the Clintons like that. I mean, there was a, there was a politics angle too, right? I mean, especially in, I guess that was 2015 or 2016 when she was friends with Chelsea Clinton and throwing fundraisers for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Um, what it did, did, what role did politics have in this? Well, she, she definitely, uh, cultivated politicians. Um, she, she cultivated, uh, Jim Mattis, uh, who is now our secretary of defense. Um, after he retired from, uh, uh, the military, a couple months later, he joined the Theranos board. She, uh, her main uh, point of entry with the political class was G George Schultz. Um, 
the uh, former Secretary of State who uh, crafted the Reagan administration's foreign policy. Um, uh, George lives right off the Stanford campus, has always been passionate about science. Uh, uh, Elizabeth was introduced to him in early 2011, and he quickly joined the board. And then he introduced her to Henry Kissinger and uh, Bill Frist, uh, Sam Nunn, Bill Perry, former Secretary of State under um, Bill Clinton. And that's how she came to have this this unbelievable board uh, made up of these uh, former cabinet members and, and ex-military uh, commanders. Um, and she also cultivated, as you said, the Clintons. Uh, she she uh, did several events with uh, the Clinton Foundation, uh, was interviewed on stage by Bill Clinton, and uh, became friendly with Chelsea. And that fundraiser you refer to, uh, which was initially going to be held at uh, the headquarters of Theranos and then was relocated, uh, that actually happened um, a good uh, uh, five months after I broke the scandal. And um, it was becoming increasingly uh, clear from the fallout and from regulators' uh, actions that, that my reporting was correct. Um, and yet, uh, she still managed to uh, be invited to this uh, Clinton fundraiser at the House of a, uh, an Entrepreneur in San Francisco and, and even addressed uh, the audience there. Uh, and there's a picture of her that you can easily find on, on the web uh, standing next to Chelsea Clinton holding a microphone. So, so you said uh, it was six months after your your report came out in 2015, and uh, and at the point at which it was believed. So, in the beginning, the Theranos attacked you, said what you had written wasn't true, that you were in bed with the people that you know that she was trying to disrupt, uh, in bed with the medical, the current medical industry. Just sort of painted a, their own picture of of your uh, what was behind your reporting. Talk a little bit about what that was like. Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, aggressive counterattack started even before publication, way before publication in uh, June of 2015. David Boys, who was at, at that time outside counsel for Theranos, uh, came with several of his associates. And Heather King, who had been a partner at Boyce Schiller, had also uh, once been a Hillary Clinton aide. And she had just become general counsel of Theranos. So she, she was like an arm of Boyce Schiller at Theranos. The four of them and, and uh, three other people came uh, to our offices and, and we had this uh, uh, conflictual and very surreal five hour meeting in a conference room in, in the uh, midtown Manhattan newsroom of the journal. Um, and their demeanors were very aggressive. Um, you know, they put uh, little tape recorders uh, at the beginning of the meeting at each end of the conference room table. And the message was unmistakably that they were considering the meeting as a, a sort of deposition in a future legal proceeding. Um, and, uh, I pulled out my iPhone and, and started pressing record as well. I figured if they're recording, I need to record too. Um, and then they, uh, they told us that, uh, that, you know, they, first of all, that I had misappropriated, uh, Theranos trade secrets and that I needed to, uh, destroy them or return them uh, as soon as possible. And, um, uh, they refused to answer many of my questions about how many blood tests were done on, on Theranos technology and how many on commercial machines, claiming that these were trade secrets. And so we went around in circles for like hours. Um, and, uh, you know, it got tense at times. Uh, David Boys at times got angry, um, told us at one point during the meeting that he was going to send us a letter making clear what, what Theranos' legal stance was. And sure enough, a couple of days later, we got the letter and then more letters after that that um, you know, very explicitly uh, threaten us with litigation with a lawsuit if we uh, pursued the reporting any further. And then it got even more surreal when um, I became uh, convinced, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that some of my confidential sources were being surveilled. Um, and uh, one of my sources was Tyler Schultz, uh, the grandson of George Schultz, who was on the board of Theranos. And Tyler had worked for eight months at the company, and, and I had made contact with him, and he had corroborated what uh, many of the things that my first source had told me. Suddenly, uh, he went dark, and uh, I figured I couldn't reach him anymore, even though uh, I had uh, the number of this burner phone that he'd been contacted me, contacting me with. And I also had this email address. Uh, he was no longer re returning calls or emails. And uh, I figured Theranos was putting the screws to him. I didn't learn until a year later what had happened. Um, 
Theranos ambushed him at his grandfather's house uh, one evening in, in the spring of uh, 2015. And one of the Boyce Schiller attorneys, Mike Brill, um, was like an attack dog and tried to force him to admit that he was talking to a journal reporter and uh, tried to get him to sign documents and to name the journal sources. And uh, Tyler, uh, that, w- that was the, the starting point of a, a pressure campaign that lasted months. Um, and Theranos tried to essentially get Tyler to recant uh, what he had told me and, and to also name my sources. And Tyler had to get legal representation, which uh, ended up costing his parents nearly half a million dollars. Um, and he, he put up with an unbelievable ordeal for months uh, until I, we finally published my story in October of 2015. And then, as you said, uh, that the pushback continued. Um, uh, uh, David Boyes uh, gave several interviews in which he hinted that, um, that Theranos would sue. Uh, Heather King, uh, the general counsel, after each story that I published, uh, sent the journal uh, letters um, uh, insisting that we... Uh, that, that we uh, print retractions for essentially everything that I had written in my stories um, and putting us on notice that if we didn't, we, we would get sued. Um, so it, it was tense. Uh, but at the same time, I had done so much reporting. I had talked to so many people that I knew uh, I was in the right. And, and uh, Elizabeth Holmes came to our tech conference uh, in Laguna Beach about 10 days after my story was published. And I figured she was going to come out swinging, uh, but what I didn't expect is her to lie again and again, bald face lie the way she did over the course of this half hour interview with our technology editor. Um, and that was pretty stunning. Uh, but when I thought about it, it was also in character and, and really uh, dovetailed with everything I had heard about the way she operated. Um, so this, you know, this, this sort of counterattack lasted for months until finally um, one of the health regulators, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, made public the, the findings of its regulatory inspection. And it became clear that uh, according to Theranos' own data, uh, its Edison machine, which, by the way, was only used for at, at most 12 tests, didn't work. Its, its results were all over the map and completely unreliable. And then uh, the inspection report also showed uh, that there were uh, – innumerable problems with the way the lab was run, that the lab didn't have a real director, uh, that, that uh, most of the tests were run on commercial machines, and, um, and pretty much you know, confirmed all of my reporting. And she was, uh, by July of uh, 2016, or sorry, yes, July 2016, banned by CMS from running a laboratory for two years. And um, by then, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco had both opened investigations. And uh, as we now know, the, the SEC a couple months ago filed uh, fraud charges against Elizabeth and Sonny and Theranos. Uh, Elizabeth settled them without uh, admitting or denying wrongdoing. Sonny is fighting them. Um, and the uh, criminal investigation is ongoing. Wow. So uh, we have a, a chat room that that watches live with us right now. And um, Knox Harrington in the chat room says this would make a great movie. And it is. Uh, this, someone has already bought the rights to the movie. Um, he also asks, I'm trying to think who should play Holmes. And someone guessed Jessica Chastain or Jennifer Lawrence, which it is going to be Jennifer Lawrence, obviously. Um, I'm very excited about that. Uh and someone else in the chat room said that that uh, Elizabeth Holmes has uh, had the secret to, to being successful, be young, pretty, and uh, don't uh, know how to never blink. And so bef- I want to take a break to thank our sponsor. But after that, I want to talk about uh, that uh, and gender because it's uh, it's it played a really interesting role in this whole story um, because we do. I mean, I spend a lot of time talking about gender inequality uh, in technology and um and th- this isn't exactly that, but it is complicated. And I, I want to talk to you about that as well. But first, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. The mortgage process was not keeping up with the times. You know, it was old fashioned, dated. It needed a client focused technological revolution. That's what I love about so many of our sponsors. We just, there's a problem, and you throw technology at it and you solve it. They will give you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It is super simple. You can fully understand all the details and then be confident that you're getting the right mortgage 
for you. A mortgage is very, very personal thing. You want the one that you can afford for the house that you want. And Rocket Mortgage is also very convenient. They have trusted partners that allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button on your smartphone, on your tablet, Android, iOS. It's everywhere you are. And it's powerful. So you might be looking to buy your first home. Maybe you're lucky enough to be buying your 10th home. If you have 10 homes, please tell me how you did that. I would like to know. Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. So you and your one home or your 10, you can find the right mortgage for any of your homes. So this is all based on your income, your assets, your credit. Rocket Mortgage will analyze all of your home loan options, all of the ones that you qualify for, and then find the one that's right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply. Understand fully mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. That's rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Don't forget to add the triangulation. That is how Rocket Mortgage knew that you came from us to them. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage for sponsoring Triangulation. I am talking to John Kerry Rue. He is a Wall Street Journal reporter and the author of Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup, which is about Theranos. And uh, I, 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 all throughout reading your book and, and you know, reading your stories first um, in the journal and thinking about this story, I just think that gender has, has, has played such an interesting, interesting role because, and, and youth also age. Um, Elizabeth Holmes was 19 when she started. She was very attractive, had giant blue eyes. And, uh, and you know, we don't spend a lot of time talking about what color eyes Mark Zuckerberg has or uh, what color he dyed his hair. Um, but I think that a lot of this uh, happened because she was a woman. And I think people are were hungry for a female Steve Jobs or a female Mark Zuckerberg um, or just, just someone that, you know, they could say, look, like we, you know, everyone can do this. Um, but unfortunately she was a liar and a fraud. So uh, I don't know what that says about this, but let's talk a little bit about like the people that were on her side, Tim Draper, and then the CEO of Safeway. And what role do you think gender played in their um, just sort of overlooking um, the, just the obvious, uh, problems with what she was doing. I think gender did play a role in, in her rise. And, um, uh, you know, she, she really charmed older men. It, it may be controversial to say that, uh, these days amid the me too movement. But, uh, if you look at the, the, his, the 12 year history of Theranos before I came along and exposed what was going on, um, it was one older man after another that she wrapped around her finger and uh, whose support she gained, it started with Channing Robinson, her uh, uh, Stanford engineering school professor who uh, joined her board when she founded the company as a, as a Stanford dropout and uh, accompanied her to uh, pitch meetings with VCs, gave her credibility when she was just a teenager. Uh, she later met Don Lucas um, and uh, Don Lucas was, was uh, you know, enamored with her. I think he, he saw her almost as a daughter. Um, and later George Schultz and, and all these other, uh, older men, uh, General Mattis, uh, Rupert, uh, Murdoch, eventually, uh, David Boyce. It's clear that she, I, I think used her, her gender, um, you know, to her advantage with these older men and that, and I don't think it was necessarily sexual at all. Uh, I think they were just, uh, uh, they, they were taken in by her intelligence, by her charisma, by her charm. Um, and they, and she was incredibly persuasive about this vision that she had and, and, uh, they wanted to support her. Uh, the other way in which gender played a role is that there was this yearning in Silicon Valley for a, uh, tech founder who would make it as big as, as the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Steve Jobs and the, and the Larry Pages and Sergey Brin's. Uh, in other words, the first, uh, founder, tech founder billionaire who was a woman. And there have been other uh, prominent uh, women in, in Silicon Valley who also become very wealthy, like Marissa Meyer and, and Sheryl Sandberg, number two at Facebook. But they were not founders. They didn't found their own companies. They were the hired help. They were early employees at, at Google. 
And uh, so Elizabeth would have been that first female billionaire founder. And th- there was uh, an appetite for that. And, and she fulfilled uh, that that appetite. And, and unfortunately, it was it was not real. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I want to say, like, we, we use whatever we've got, right? I mean, like, just trying, you know, you you trying to convince someone of your products, um, the importance of your product, you, you kind of just you do what you need to do, um, whoever you are. But but you don't have to, like, the prob- the fact is, like, she was, she was misrepresenting a medical product, not just saying, like, I have this device that's going to, you know, juice all your organic vegetables for you. Um, she was saying something that, you know, she was talking about people telling people whether they had cancer or not. So, I mean, there's a extent at which, um, you know, it has nothing to do with the fact that she was a woman. She was a liar. Right. I mean, uh, you know, when it's fraud, it's fraud. It, it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman. The, the gender uh, becomes irrelevant. If if there really is fraud going on, there's white collar crime going on, then then. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, I, I would argue that it's a sign of equality. We now have, you know, uh, a woman has joined the ranks of uh, con men. And uh, that, that's a sign that, you know, um, w- you know, as, as there are more women in business uh, who become high profile, that uh, as is the case with men, some of them will be bad apples. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's OK. I mean, it's not OK that frauds are committed, but I think we we. Um, uh, I should accept that women too can be villains. Um, you know, it's, it's not always men. So was there, um, as I was reading this, I kept thinking, what, were there a lot of Theranoses? Like, were there a lot of people pitching products like this, but that, um, companies just investors did their due diligence and, um, you know, is, is the Valley full of companies like that? People trying to push even medical devices that aren't, exactly working but but the they happen to have founders that that didn't um that that weren't that the people weren't so hungry to to give money to i i don't i don't think so in in the medical space um i think that the fake it till you make it is definitely um has long been part of uh, silicon valley's dna um, there's a term that was coined in the early eighties, uh, called vaporware, and it's used to describe, uh, computer software or hardware that was announced with, announced with great fanfare by uh, a company and then either never delivered or delivered years late without the promised features. Um, and, you know, people like Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison were uh, accused at various points of engaging in this practice. Um, I think it's more acceptable uh, that that sort of behavior is more acceptable when you're dealing with a computer product or a smartphone app that that isn't a a product that's going to be used to make uh health decisions i think the second you enter the medical realm you have to be um, reminded of the fact that your end user ultimately is the patient and that your product is going to have an impact on that patient's life Um, And that's something, unfortunately, that that Elizabeth Holmes either lost sight of or chose to deliberately ignore. And and I think that's one of the huge lessons of the Theranos scandal as uh, the traditional tech industry in Silicon Valley and uh, health innovation increasingly converge. I think that convergence is only going to intensify, I would say, to the the founders um, and the, the VCs. Uh, active in this health tech space, um, you know, remember always that uh, ultimately you're dealing with patients and uh, Theranos is is exhibit A of what can go wrong if you don't bear that in mind. So do you feel like you, you got pushback about um, your writing starting in 2015 because she was a woman? Like, were there, did you get a feeling of people? Did you get attacked for, for for being sexist for attacking this w- w- woman that they wanted to be the first you know, young female billionaire founder? It, there was some of that. I mean, most of it was driven by Elizabeth herself. Um, she, uh, you know, uh, spun this narrative that I was sexist, and um, you know, she gave an interview to Bloomberg Business Week, which did a, a cover story. I think it was in November. Uh, of 2000 or might have been December of 2015 
about a month after I came out with my first story. And, uh, and, you know, Elizabeth is very explicit in that story saying that, that, um, the difficulties that she's encountering are due to her gender and that, um, you know, um, basically playing the, the sexist card, um, and, and, uh, you know, there, there were other, uh, venture capitalists, I think in, in Silicon Valley who also argued that point. Um, those, uh, the, the people who said this, I think, um, stopped saying it, uh, as the months went by and as regulatory inspections and investigation, uh, investigations one by one bore out my reporting. And I, and I think, you know, 99, probably 0.9% of people now realize that the wall street journal was right all along and that this was a fraud i think the the only person who doesn't uh, recognize it or at least says uh, that he doesn't is tim draper um and draper's position seems to be that uh because elizabeth had a cool vision and and was a bold entrepreneur that that excuses everything um and and uh you know sort of the the ends justifies the means and and i think most people would disagree with that if if you have a cool vision it doesn't mean that you can break the law and that you can uh commit white collar crime which is what happened in this case uh uh startup founders have to have to abide by the laws like everyone else um and just because you're an entrepreneur uh in silicon valley it doesn't mean that you're exempt so what is Elizabeth Holmes doing now and why is she not in jail? Well, as we uh, talked about earlier, the SEC has charged her with fraud and she has settled that um, she has paid a half million dollar penalty. She has relinquished most of her stock, uh, relinquished her voting control. The company agreed to an officer director ban uh, from a public company. She she won't be able to to be an officer or director in a public company for the next 10 years. there are many people who think that that you know this SEC uh, settlement um, uh, was a slap on the wrist and, and wasn't commensurate with the uh, the magnitude of the wrongdoing here. Um, uh, what people may forget is that there is the second uh, investigation that's now uh, been going on for two and a half years, uh, spearheaded by the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco, and that investigation is very advanced um, and. Uh, I think uh, we should know in a matter of months uh, what its outcome is. I, I hear from sources that criminal indictments of uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani are a distinct possibility. Um, uh, people forget that sometimes, you know, the, these cases are uh, challenging to put together. They take time. Um, it took years uh, for the uh, Enron uh, executives to be brought to justice and to be, to be put behind bars. Um, and so th- this is a complex case that involves healthcare and labs. And, um, but I am pretty confident that in the end, uh, federal prosecutors will take action and, and then, um, there should be a trial and, and we'll see what happens from there. I know you talked to a lot of Elizabeth Holmes's lawyers, um, but am I right that you've never actually spoke with her? That's right. Um, I tried to interview her for five and a half months before my first story in October 2015 was published. And then sporadically, I I went back to her uh, PR uh, people and and asked for interviews and was always turned down. I made another big push when I went on book leave in the fall of 2016. Um, And I argued to to her uh, PR handler that, um, you know, this was Elizabeth's chance to uh, you know, influence the, the narrative in the book and, and to give uh, her input. And it really, she had nothing to lose from, from doing that. Um, but I didn't get anywhere with that argument. And uh, she has steadfastly refused to, to speak to me. So do you think, I mean, you, you write so much about like how Theranos went, uh, did like sort of an end run, tried to do an end run around the, the FDA. But is there a way in which um, the FDA the, is a little bit uh, stifling innovation in some ways? Like, I, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not glad that, the, I'm not, you know, I'm glad that Theranos didn't get through all of these trials. But um, is there a way in which you think innovation might be stifled a little bit by the, the policies, the current policies of the FDA? I, I don't see how, how um, uh, if anything, you know, the, the Theranos story uh, argues for uh, more power 
to be given to the to the FDA and and the FDA in fact in recent years in the in the final years of the Obama administration uh, was working on trying to close this loophole that uh, Theranos exploited which has to do with laboratory developed tests uh, which are tests that labs fashion with their own methods and their own devices as opposed to uh, blood tests that are run on uh, FDA approved uh, diagnostic equipment and uh, historically the FDA has not policed that area of the lab business and, and the Centers for Medicare uh, and Medicaid uh, Services, which is the uh, chief regulator of labs, has also not closely policed uh, laboratory developed tests. And Theranos really ran an 18 wheeler truck uh, through that loophole by arguing that its finger stick tests were laboratory developed tests because they were done on proprietary Theranos technology that was not commercialized and not sold to other labs. Um, and that enabled it to keep both of those regulators at arm's length. Um, and, and so I would argue that the, the Theranos scandal, um, you know, uh, would beg for more regulation of the lab space and, and to give the FDA more power. Um, but unfortunately, under the Trump administration, the FDA has gone in the opposite direction and has abandoned its push to uh, police uh, LDTs, um, which I think is unfortunate. Mm. Um, so when you see like Apple, the Apple watch getting in, you know, now, like I'll be notified if my heart rate is elevated when I'm just, you know, sitting down and then there's like, they're, they're slow, slowly moving more into that health space. And, uh, Cardia is, you know, the, another health device that I think has FDA approval that was, you know, made by s someone who used to work at Google. Like, so when you see those tech Titans moving into the health space, does that worry you? Not necessarily. I mean, I, I don't think that everyone in Silicon Valley is corrupt. Um, I, I think that there there are a lot of people, um, you know, who, who have moral compasses and, and have boundaries and, and know what bright red lines not to cross. And and uh, I, Apple is a very mature company now. It's been around for decades um, and uh, it's got the the. Uh, the, the money to hire uh, people who can help it get it right, uh, including uh, regulatory compliance people and scientists and, and doctors. And there's no reason that they, they can't put as many resources in, in that as they put in uh, building uh, smart watches and smartphones. So you mentioned that still no one has cracked the code of having to get like, you know, all these tests with just a single ping, pin prick of blood is there are there still are there currently people working in this space there there have been many researchers in, in academia and industry that have been working on that uh i'd argue for the past 15 20 years and uh, no one has gotten close to um you know the basically solving the, the problem that that you have to use completely different instruments and techniques uh for these different classes of blood tests um an another problem is, uh, even though you, you have had progress in microfluidics, um, there, there's always some loss of blood when you transfer the small sample to the microfluidic uh, device. And, you know, a loss of a teeny bit of sample doesn't matter when you've got quite a bit of sample. But when you're already starting from a, a small quantity, uh, lo losing uh, some in, in that transfer is, is usually a big setback and hard to recover from. So I'm not um, necessarily pessimistic that, that some of these uh, challenges won't be solved in, in the coming decade and decades, but it's going to take time and it's going to take a lot of research. And, um, you know, it, it's not easy. Medical research and science are not easy. So I know we didn't talk much about Sonny Balwani, who was Elizabeth's husband, I mean, boyfriend. And um, so I'll leave that, I'll, I'll leave that to the book. People, you have to read the book to find out how he um, features in this bizarre story. So the book's going to be made into a movie. Um, and are do you know who's writing the script? Uh, Vanessa Taylor, who co-wrote co The Shape of Water. Oh. Uh has recently been been hired to write the screenplay and I've already talked to her several times. Um, and I think she's great. And, uh, um, you know, Adam McKay is uh, slated to direct. So that that's Jennifer Lawrence to, to play Elizabeth Holmes. It's kind of a, a, a dream team, really, that's come together for this uh, movie. 
I can't wait. I hope that she gets that deep voice right, the the affected deep voice. It's so I still watch videos of Elizabeth Holmes because I just it's just I mean, I know it's uh, not politically correct to talk about women's voices and women get complain, you know, get criticized constantly for having high uplift. And I'm a podcaster. I've heard it all. But uh, it's just it, it is really <laughs> bizarre. So I hope she's able to I'm sure she will be able to capture that um, that part of, uh, of Elizabeth Holmes um I guess obsession with Steve Jobs. So, so now you're. Are you done reporting this story? I, I mean, the story is not over. So, is that is this still your your most important beat, or have you moved on? I'm beginning to move on. I mean, I, I'm going to keep an eye on uh, developments uh, with Theranos, and and uh, there are two shoes that I expect to drop, and that I'm waiting uh, to see whether they drop. One is uh, the the company uh, being liquidated by Fortress Investment Group, which is the private equity firm that loaned it $65 million last year to keep it afloat. Um, uh, that that liquidation of the Theranos asset, assets by Fortress should happen by August, at which point the, the company should cease to exist. Um, I'll probably write a, a story about that. And then uh, the other big shoe that I'm watching for is what happens with the criminal investigation. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's fair to say that I'll be I'll I'll be moving on to to other stories, um, but I'll be updating the epilogue of the book uh, for the paperback edition when it comes out in a year with whatever has happened between now and then. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us. John Kerry Rue is the author of Bad Blood: Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. It is available anywhere you get books. Um, the audiobook also available. Um, if you start reading the the Kindle, if just start reading the Kindle sample, and you will not be able to not finish it. That was uh, how I I started, and it's just like when you get to the end of that sample, because I hate reading in the Kindle. I I need books, but um, I always try that first. So I I promise, if you start reading it, you you won't want to stop. So um, thank you so much, and you can follow John at the Wall Street Journal or at John Kerry Rue um, on Twitter. And th thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. Thank you for having, having me. It was fun. All right. Take care. And thank you for joining us on Triangulation. Triangulation records every Friday around 3 p.m. Pacific or whenever we can track down our guests. And you can watch live at twit.tv slash live. And, of course, you can get it, the video or the audio podcast, wherever you, wherever fine podcasts are given away free. You can download them and subscribe to Triangulation. And you'll get, every week, you'll get a, a new uh, and interesting long-form interview uh, with someone uh, who is exploring all of the uh, interesting things going on in tech. And you can subscribe at twit.tv slash try, T-R-I. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah.